story was that knowing the perfection um, gives you pleasure, and since there's this fantastic perfection, this will be fantastic pleasure, and so this would give rise to the love. Actually, it would constitute the love because of the way Leibniz okay, yeah, defines so sort of, love. Okay, this is why I'm going, but actually, so I was looking at um, quotation 11 here, and I mean, so there he says, uh, the love consists in the state that makes one take pleasure in the perfections and happiness of the object. So it looks like there, uh -huh. um, as if the love is actually a precondition for us to be capable in the first place to take uh, pleasure in the perfection of the object. Um, uh, so I realize that uh, this is in slight tension with 12, where he just says, well, it's just if you see the perfection, there is pleasure. Yeah. I mean, one way to fiddle with that would be either to say, well, uh, love consists in the state that makes one take pleasure in the perfection and, and the happiness of the object. So you either put the happiness in there, or you say, he didn't really mean 12 because, uh, you know, I really don't, uh, you know, take pleasure in the perfection of whatever that table, you know, the table has a certain perfection just because he, uh, it exists, but you know that's not enough. So the the real pleasure is really only for the perfection of the objects that I love. So you know then you could bring in why in eleven he actually seems to be saying that love is actually a condition for me to take pleasure in the perfection of a thing, namely the one that I love. Um, so this is all basically to say in the end, um, don't you think that the love of God isn't really the, uh, the basic first thing uh, that isn't supposed to be explained by all the other stuff, but rather the other way around? And that, of course, then leaves open. So where does the love of God come from and what exactly gives rise to it? And I think there the story, I mean, it goes back to Don's paper in a way. So maybe that's really just, that's where the grace comes in. It's really not something I could intellectually see you know, the perfections of God and thereby come to love him or whatever. It's rather that I got to start out with it first to love him and then I could come to the state of blessedness because then the perfections actually bring me happiness and all of that. Uh, that's, those, are, those are good points. I think it's probably going to be impossible to make all Leibniz's, everything Leibniz wrote on this subject consistent on this point because uh, there are certainly plenty of places where uh, Leibniz, you know, at least taking him face value, asserts flatly that if you understand God's perfections better, you will love him more, uh, just flat out. Uh, so I think, if anything, that, that uh, quote, the passage from uh, Principles of Nature and Grace uh, is exceptional. Uh, it might be... Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, th I think the question is, is the love the state of taking pleasure in the pleasure or perfection, as he sometimes says, of somebody else, or is it the state of being disposed to take pleasure in the pleasure uh, of somebody else? And um, uh, those are two different definitions, and... Uh, I think that what Leibniz says tends to be more shaped by the one that, that doesn't equate the love with the disposition, uh, although I guess I'd have to agree that uh, the one that does equate it with the disposition is more in line with ordinary conceptions of love. Jerry. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, given the idea that hell is sustained by perpetual sinning, people keep sinning in hell, is there any reason in principle why on Leibniz's uh, metaphysical views God couldn't determine all of the people in hell to repent freely and gladly and thus end up with a world in which everybody gladly loves God or even have done this earlier perhaps and any reason why this wouldn't have been a better world than one in which people are determined to sin and go to hell? Uh Leibniz uh, would deny that, look, let's suppose, for example, uh, that uh, uh, Judas Iscariot and Adolf Hitler are being 
punished for their crimes and will never repent and will always be, uh, go on being punished for their new crimes. Uh, if that's true in Leibniz's system, then God couldn't, absolutely could not, have de determined uh, Judas Iscariot and Adolf Hitler to repent uh, because in Leibniz's scheme of things, uh, each possible individual e substance exists in o other than God, exists in only one possible world. And of course, God doesn't exist in worlds because he's not one of the, the contingent substances. Uh, uh, so, and that, that assumption of Leibniz's philosophy is one on which that argument that I discussed turns that uh, if God had given you more strength, he wouldn't have created you, he'd have created somebody else instead of you. Uh, so God can't tinker with what's true about the possible substances that God thinks of creating. Uh, they are given in, as possible substances with everything that's true about them in complete detail. God can only choose among uh, substances whose, uh, you might say, with their complete histories. Uh, so the question is, uh, why shouldn't God have chosen only substances, uh, you know, in creating intelligent beings, why shouldn't God have chosen to create only ones that would not go on sinning forever? Uh, and uh, that, in fact, is a question that I was pressing on Leibniz, so to speak. I agree, that's a, that's a serious question for his theodicy. Uh, last question? Yeah, uh, it sort of changed uh, through the course of listening to these questions. Um, I guess the, my first problem was, uh, as I was listening to the story, it looked like uh, if God, um, for people who are being saved, it, for those people, they, they love God, uh, and, and the love of God is sort of its intrinsic reward, and so they're okay. And the people who aren't being saved, well, they're, they're better off living than not, uh, and so they're okay. And, and so we've theodicy complete. Um, uh, we've done it. But then it seems like something's missing. And, and, and when you sometimes brought in the analog of the monarch, uh, and maybe a well-organized society, you get you get you sort of see what's missing, and what's missing is how these interrelate, uh, these good people and these bad people, and and so you think uh, for a monarch, of course, then there's an issue of educating, and there's an issue of setting up laws, punishments, and getting the the the, the system working well, and and then and that's all determines whether the monarch is good or bad. It doesn't look like it's the intrinsic things. It's this interrelation, and, 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 and in the interrelation, getting rid of as much evil as possible. Well, uh, I think that uh, I don't see Leibniz uh, offering any criteria for excellence of government uh, that are not, uh, so far as I can see, responsible only to considerations of outcomes of weal and woe for individual members of the society and perhaps of uh, justly proportionate allocation of uh, costs and benefits related to merits and demerits, or demerits and merits. Uh, uh, and I also was expressing skepticism about whether the kinds of holistic considerations about values of order in a whole system that Leibniz does seem to rest a lot on in his reasonings about theology, really have a well-grounded place in his metaphysics. And of course, studies 
that have been done on uh, how to understand the, the evaluation of possible worlds for Leibniz have uh, produced some interpretations uh, in which Leibniz is committed to the view that the best of all possible worlds we will be, will have among its attributes that it is of all the possible worlds the one in which the sum of the individual values of the individual substances in it is the greatest. Uh, and uh, that also tends to, uh, I mean, that, that strikes me as something that sort of fits my uneasiness about the, the holistic uh, considerations in Leibniz's philosophy. I mean, as I said, I suspect, I suspect that, that this concern may not have occurred to Leibniz, uh, and that if it did occur, he would be pretty unhappy about it at first. Uh, but it seems to me that, uh, that it's there. Also, I will say that about heaven and hell, um, Leibniz, I don't recall reading the word hell in the theodicy. Is it there, Bob? I so. Sean? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, what's clear in Leibniz's conception of this is that he's talking about uh, rewards and punishments in the city of God. The people that are being punished are not thrown out of the city of God. They are, they are still members of the city of God. So it's not, uh, not a matter of different places uh, in Leibniz's uh, thinking about it. And one of the reasons why uh, Eberhard and Lessing end up with their relatively mild view of the nature or intensity of the punishments that belong in the Leibnizian system is, I think, their awareness of the fact that Leibniz's philosophy is a great chain of being philosophy in which uh, there are created substances of an enormous and, in principle, continuous range of degrees of perfection, uh, which would suggest that, and if that, and if that doesn't end with, uh, you know, the deaths of all of us and so forth, but goes on, then one might expect that there would be, uh, uh, there would always be substances that created substances that love God purely above all things, and uh, then others that are pretty virtuous but don't get to that stage, and others that are less virtuous, and so on and so on, and that that's the way it would always be. And aside from trying to, you know, uh, fit, you know, harmonize his system with some theological texts, uh, that does in fact look to me like the sort of view that one would expect Leibniz to hold. Okay, before we thank our speaker one last time, I should remind you that tomorrow it's at 9.30 in this room and um, that this most well-endowed of conferences also sponsors another reception after this. And um, so if you're hungry, there's going to be food and the like out there. Um, let's, though, thank our speaker for this. Week.